but um but yeah i i, I love maryland it's, it's maryland dc it's a it's a great place for sure yeah all right. all right so let's then uh, take it away it's time to get started so hey guys welcome back to an another uh, webinar from SEO ranking my name is andrew coming to you live from kiev and today i will be your host we are also joined by link building expert among other things farzad rashidi i can't wait to to introduce him to all of you guys but before i do i just want to make sure that everyone can see and hear us so if you can find that chat and uh, let us know where you guys are joining us from today Yeah, last time it took uh, like a minute for everything to sync up. So I mean, I'm just checking in on back on YouTube to see if people are interacting with us. It's all good. All right. If anybody's there and you can see and hear us, let us know, please. Just so that we can make sure that everything is going according to plan. I can see a message from Haas, but okay, we have one. There Romania, great, thanks, thanks. So that means that we are ready for the show. Uh, the only... Oh, somebody's missing the sound. I hope that, okay, so um, no sound. I'm hoping that, that that is not a problem for most of you guys. Okay, so the majority says that we we are good to go. So let's go ahead and continue. So, um, before we uh, go to the main event, uh, I want to say a couple of words about what's going to happen here today. So, um, first, Farzad will uh, share with us his, pre his presentation, and then we'll, we will have a Q&A session. And make sure to stick around because we have a special bonus for the most interesting question, and that is up to Farzad to decide because he is the link building expert. So you have to impress him with your question. And that uh, the bonus that we have is the optimum subscription plan for one month. And if you're worried about taking notes and uh, trying to stay uh, uh, and, and at pace with us, don't worry. The recording will be live, uh, will be up on YouTube basically as soon as the webinar ends. So just relax and soak it all in. Uh, and uh, we should take about an hour uh, tops. So. Let's move on to the big uh, question for today. So we are going to focus on uh, link building and how you can grow uh, your traffic using this method. So within SEO, link, link building plays an important role in driving organic traffic via search engines, especially in competitive industries. But when it's combined with strong technical SEO foundations, great on-page SEO, excellent content, and a good user experience, link building can be super effective. So we, we invited the ex, one of the uh, industry experts to, to, to let us know what, the, what is going on with link, link building and how we can take advantage of it to our uh, advantage. And uh, I'm finally ready to introduce, introduce Farzad, who is joining us from the United States. He'll, of course, he's going to be uh, saying a, a few words about himself as well. But he is the co-founder of Respana, an all-in-one PR and link building tool that combines personalization with productivity. He also runs all the marketing efforts at Visme, where he helped the company go from uh, gain over 8 million users and pass the 2 million organic uh, traffic mark. So uh, without further ado, I'm, I can't wait to see uh, to hear what Farzad has to share with us. So please take it away. Okay, perfect. Well, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Andrew. I appreciate it. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as uh, Andrew mentioned, my name is Farzad. I'm the co-founder of Respana. And today we're going to talk about link building. Now, if you guys are in the SEO space, let me go ahead and actually share my screen here. And Andrew, I wish you would stick around and tell me whether you guys can see my screen okay. And actually, yeah, guys, yeah. if you got go ahead and put in the chat bar, if you guys can see my screen okay, should be a VizMe presentation that goes uh, growing traffic from zero to two million through link building. Yeah, I'm just going to hybrid now, but I'm going to be uh, keep uh, be on the lookout if, if something goes wrong and just be on the lookout for the questions. So yeah, of course. Awesome. Perfect. Well, as far as you guys can see my screen okay, then that's all I need to know. Awesome. Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and dive in, see how we can get a couple million 
monthly organic traffic in the door. Now, just to give you guys a quick little background here, um, lots of lots of businesses are doing content marketing. Now, if you guys are using tools like SEO ranking or some of the other SEO tools, I'm sure you guys have heard of you know the power of content, content is king. And everything really most likely just revolves around the process of content creation and how to be able to optimize content and keyword density and keyword research. And, and uh, you know, one thing that a lot of businesses get wrong is that they treat their blog like a newspaper. They just expect that and say, if they go ahead and put content out in the public, they would just, um, you know, traffic would just magically show up at their door. Now, it might be the case if you guys are, you know, Apple or Google, but you know, for little guys like us that are uh, that have a site that started, uh, you know, maybe a number of years ago, and that that's just not something that's realistic or feasible um, for for most people. Now, the one other idea that comes to mind is is just to to do paid advertising, right? So it's it's quite easy. Uh, to focus more on PPC because it's just very easy to measure and especially in terms of cost of customer acquisition, CAC, and and be able to kind of, uh, you know, have a clear cut ROI on your um, on your revenue. And, and, and it, it sounds great, you know, after doing paid advertising campaigns for a number of years, uh, you, you sort of hit a plateau in a way because paid advertising has a bidding system. So they are the costs are rising as as advertisers are getting more efficient as more and more people are starting to do them that gets a lot more competitive and more expensive hence a lot less cost effective for it to make sense in 2021 and if you actually just take a look at how much cost per click has been increased in just a one year period that we have data for it's almost been double a little over 25 cents to almost you know 44 45 cents now the way we've gone around this, especially for our parent company called Visme. Now, if you guys haven't heard of Visme before, this is actually the software I'm using for my presentation today. Uh, that is basically, we're an all-in-one um, infographic and presentation software that allows people to be able to create beautiful looking content in a matter of a few minutes. And uh, that's, we're a completely bootstrap company, haven't raised a single dollar in outside funding, got over um, eight, eight and a half million uh, organic traffic, uh, excuse me, eight, eight and a half million users. And basically the way we've gone about, uh, you know, I would say putting together this machine that would consistently bring us a, a flow of traffic has been through organic search and SEO. Now, one thing that, uh, and there goes the Visme website. So if you guys haven't heard us, feel free to go in and look up Visme. You can create a free account to play around with it. And and basically, let me go ahead and dive back into presentation here. I'm not sure why my slides have been, uh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Now, as far as the organic traffic goes, with Visme, we're getting anywhere between two to two and a half million organic visitors to our site every month. Now, SEO tools, obviously, like SEO ranking are a bit of a estimate. So they normally underestimate the traffic a little, uh, depending on what geographic location they're focused mainly. Uh, but according to SEO ranking, we're about 1.6 1, 1. million, which is quite close. And that's worth about $3.8 million in worth of AdWords that we're getting on a monthly basis without actually spending a, a very you know, uh, quite a lot of money on advertising. We actually do very little on paid ads compared to our size. And it's not something that I look at these numbers and say, okay, these guys have been doing this for a number of years. Obviously, this has taken a good amount of resources, take, taken a good amount of energy over the years. It's, it doesn't have to take that long. So Respana itself, we actually started link building in January 2020. So a little over a year ago, we actually started taking our blog and, and, and promoting the content pieces that we're creating. And our response is getting a little over 20K organic traffic per month, which again, you know, the AC ranking shows at 12.1, which it's just quite close. And that's worth about 52, 53K worth of paid advertising where we're getting uh, in the door without actually having to spend that money because we, we're getting traffic organically. And that's uh, basically something that we've accomplished 
through a reasonable, I would say, a, a reasonably short period of time. Now, the way we've gone about and content creation is quite scientific. Now, one, one, as I said, a missing piece of content normally is the backlinks that power them and enable them to start getting rankings on social. Now, if you actually take a look at, you know, at some studies that have been done by Backlinko, um, it, it's quite it's easy to understand the correlation between the number of backlinks and the quality and relevancy of those backlinks to the, the rankings that they get in Google and other search engines, because that's just how the algorithm is set up. So the way I would always describe uh, Google algorithms, that it's more of a mean girls popularity contest, right? So the more relevant authority sources are linking back to and they're talking about you. That is a indication of authenticity, indication of quality as of these search engines so that and you know 95 percent of these pages and these blog posts that are getting out and about tens of thousands of blog posts are getting published every day have zero backlinks so even having one or two quality links from really quality relevant sites goes a long way when it comes to uh basically um uh, get increasing the chances and the likelihood of your content actually being seen for your target keywords. Now, there's a, a variety of different content promotion strategies. I wanna go through a few different techniques today, but you might've heard of you know the competitive uh, uh, backlink strategy, the anchor tech strategy, skyscraper, and you know creating linkable assets as far as infographics and original research. I'm gonna dive deep into one of the very uh, important and I would say one of the most fruitful strategies that we've um, done and experiment with both at Vizme and Respana. And I can show you step by step exactly what we've done and what has worked and what, you know, didn't. Now, the, anytime we put out a piece of content, so we have, let me actually go ahead really quick here, take a little leeway and go ahead and show you guys how exactly we built our site structure. So let's take me take Vizme as an example before I dive into the link building structure. So anytime we, we build a site, so we did the same thing for Respondo, we, we, we've done this over the years for Vizme, is that anytime you guys go and look up a certain keyword, say for example, as a user standpoint, if I wanna find a presentation software and I don't have a solution already, What's the first thing you do? You go ahead and look up presentation maker, presentation software. And as a user, I immediately ignore all the ads and go straight to the first organic search results. And that's how we normally come up with, or find a tool and solution like ours. So we don't really have top of mind awareness or a huge brand authority because building a brand is extremely expensive. But instead, because we're a bootstrap company, we position ourselves in, in showing up in places where people are looking for a solution like ours. But getting this up in the rank is it's easier said than done, right? So there's like 228 million search results for this keyword. So how in the, how in the world do you go from the 228th millionth right to to number one? And, and you know it's it's quite I would say a, a wrong way to look at it. Also, to just in terms of ranking, obviously matters in terms of the um, the competitiveness of the keyword and the search volume of the keyword. But I uh, but as far as um, that the general strategy goes, the way we go about building the site structure of Vizme is by first picking a few parent keywords. So say, for example, we were a tool that allows you to make presentations, infographics, social graphics, right? So those are what we call parent keywords, super high quantity, super high competitive keywords. Now, once we pick these handful of keywords, we create a landing page for each one. So this is what we call a create page. So basically, if you're if somebody's looking for a presentation maker, we want this page to show up. So this is what we call sales pages or money pages, where we basically are selling our solution. So we create these landing pages for each and every single one of our target keywords. Now, once we do this to get it up in the ranking, then what we have to do is to create topical authority, meaning indicating to Google and other search engines that, hey, we are an authoritative uh, source of information for this parent keyword. Now, the way we go about this is by creating a silo of content under each one. So for example, in this case, uh, we have our um, you know, presentation silo, meaning that for each one of these landing pages, we create a group and category of content, and we create pieces of content that are uh, followed by a certain process. Now, that process, I actually have talked about 
So if you actually go ahead and look up VizMe Marketing Strategy, we have an ebook that I personally wrote in 2019 that I actually go through step by step exactly what we've done to uh, get our content creation process down and, and how we go about identifying keywords and, and basically prioritizing them uh, along with some outer strides. So feel free to go in and take a look at this ebook. Uh, if you got a chance today, it's free. But that that basically explains the process of how we go about creating these pieces of content. But here's a kicker. <laughs> From every single time we put out a piece of content, we create what we call an internal link to our main money page. So for example, this is how to memorize a presentation. And if you actually go ahead and inspect this page, you can actually see that here we have gone ahead and included a link to our presentation software landing page. And this is what we call an internal link. So meaning that anytime we put out a piece of content, we mention our target keyword or our, uh, our main landing pages in here. Then what we do is that we go ahead and start building backlinks to each and every single one of these educational resources and blog posts. And the reason why we don't go about uh, creating just backlinks to a main landing page, you might be asking yourselves, like, Fires, why don't you just, if you're, if you're going to do outreach, you might as well do outreach for building links to your presentation maker page. The, the reason being, being is that it's very difficult to convince people to do that for you, right? So it's very hard to, to, uh, to basically incentivize someone to include a link to a page that's purely a sales page. Now, if you have an educational resource, that's a different story. So what we do then after we include an internal link, we go and build backlinks to these blog posts, which I'm going to explain how exactly. And then what that does for us is hitting two birds, one stone. One, we're getting these blog posts up in the rankings first. And two, so we're getting some top of the funnel traffic to our site. And two is that these internal links to our main money pages, they're actually transferred the, the link equity to them. So cumulatively over time, these content silos, uh, once they have each and every single one of these blog posts have their own authority, that helps once you build backlinks to them, that helps passing on the link equity to the main parent page or the, to the main money page. And that that's how, and at the more blog posts you put out, the more backlinks you build to them over time, that, that keeps uh, fortifying that structure. And then that helps you get to the top three or top 10 backlinks and stay there. So now we know exactly how to build our site structure. We know why we need to do link building. We know that it's important. Now, how exactly are we going to go about doing so? So we have four groups of people that we want to build backlinks to anytime we put out a new piece of content. One, people or companies you mentioned in your article. Obviously, those are low-hanging fruit opportunities because you've already added some value to them. You already mentioned them. Two, people who have written similar articles, but I'm gonna tell you similar doesn't mean they've talked about the same exact topics. I'm gonna to share with you exactly the process we've, we've, we go through to find these people. Three is people who have shared similar articles on social media. You can use a tool like Respana or BuzzSumo to find opportunities that people have shared an article uh, that is you know, somewhat similar to the post that you've written. And fourth group is people who have linked to similar articles. So this is what we call competitor backlinks. Now, let's start with our content. So see, anytime we put out a new piece of content in VizMe, we have our own, or we have a target keyword for every single one of these blog posts. So if you go through our blog, like for example, this, the target keyword is, what is data visualization? Target keyword for this is YouTube SEO. Target keyword is, how long should a video be? And these are all keyword research. These are keywords that have the highest potential organic traffic, so meaning to have highest number of clicks combined with lowest amount of competition and highest commercial intent. When it, meaning that the, the overlapping part of that, um, you know, that sweet spot of keywords, what we call opportunity keywords. Now, one of them is called YouTube SEO. Now, how do you go about building a backlink to a blog post that we've written on YouTube SEO? So YouTube SEO is a keyword that we want to target. And again, I've been told by the SEO ranking team that you guys are mainly interested on the off-page SEO uh, side of things. So I'm not going to focus too much on how we went ahead, how we went about finding this keyword and wrote that piece of content. It's something that I explained in the ebook. But let's let's see how we go about writing, or excuse me, how we go about finding opportunities for promoting and building backlinks to this piece of content. Now we use a tool, uh, obviously called Respana, which we developed in house at Bizme. 
And, and to be honest with you, you don't have to use a tool like ours. You can go ahead and follow on the process using Google and duct tape and different tools together. Uh, obviously, we, we built this so it makes it easier for folks to um, to basically you know, build a process and and uh, kind of streamline that whole process. And hence why we decided to actually release Respond as a standalone product. So I'm gonna use our own software to uh, to explain the process and kind of go through this because it's a lot more quick and a faster, more intuitive. But at any given point, I'm gonna actually tell you how you can go ahead and replicate that without actually having to, uh, you know, uh, you you pay for a fancy tool like Respond. You can always do, do, do things manually as well. So anyways, um, Number one uh, step is finding opportunities. So how we go about finding relevant opportunities for outreach. Now, once we put together a post on YouTube SEO, I want to ideally find other pages, other blog posts that have mentioned our target keyword in there, but the overall topic of the article shouldn't be about YouTube SEO. So using this advanced operators, I can go ahead and say, okay, I want to find blog posts that are in their body, they have our target keyword in there, but in their title, they're talking about something that's slightly relevant, but not necessarily competitive. So for example, they're talking about content marketing, but they haven't mentioned YouTube SEO in there. Now, the way we go about uh, finding these articles is that, for example, this is an article on WordStream about why LSI keywords are crucial to SEO. Now, this content is a perfect example of a, the right outreach opportunity because, first of all, it's from a very quality, authoritative site that's similar to our space. We're talking about marketing, WordStream. Their founders, Larry Kim, I actually did a webinar with them a while back. Great guys. But they're talking about LSI keywords are crucial to SEO. They're not talking about YouTube SEO here. So this is not a competitive piece of content. However, if you do a little control F, you can actually see that they have mentioned our target keyword in here, YouTube SEO, and they uh, they've haven't really linked to any other resource. Now, this makes a perfect anchor to our blog post because this is a relevant site. It's an editorial contextual link from a relevant authoritative site. Now, using Responder, you can identify these opportunities and you could go ahead and select them and build a list this way. You could also import them from a tool like Ahrefs, but in Google, you can go ahead and use the same advanced operators and be able to find these opportunities. Now, step two is building a template. Now, in Responder, we have our own ready-made templates. Now, the pitch here goes something like this. So if I actually go ahead and copy paste my pitch here inside this campaign, oh, let me go ahead and copy this in here. So the pitch for this particular strategy goes something like this, like, hi, first name, and I hope you're having a great day of the week. I was just finished reading your post about uh, why LSI keywords are relevant to SEO. And notice you guys have mentioned YouTube SEO in here in your content, but didn't really dive deep. Now our team just put together a piece of content that I think would make it a really nice addition to your post. And here's the most important part of your pitch. If you're kind to give us a mention here, I'm more than happy to do X, Y, Z for you. And that's where you insert that incentive. And that incentive is really what's gonna make or break your campaign. So you wanna make sure that that's something that they actually value, that's something that they, uh, you know, obviously it could be a free subscription to your tool if you run a SaaS, it could be a link back from another site, from another guest post you're writing, it could be social shares, if you have a large social following. It's got to be something in it for them. And that's something a lot of link builders miss out. And please don't do guest post outreach like this because that bears very little value. I'm gonna walk you through exactly how we go about guest posting. Now, once we type up our pitch, and that is you know, some love for your, for example, topic article. And in this case, our topic is content marketing, right? Uh, once I have my pitch crafted, now the th third stage of the campaign, let's take a step back here really quick. So at this stage, all I've done, I just selected a bunch of articles that have mentioned our target keyword in there, but they're not competitive. Now, second step, I'll put together an email template and mentioned and talked about, um, hey, this is basically the general mold for the campaign. You can set up an auto follow-up here as well and basically talk about, okay, just a little follow-up for my pitch below. And then you wanna include at least one follow-up in there which I'm gonna dissect and tell you how that happened. The third stage is where you wanna find the right contact information of the right person. Now, this is something that is extremely important in your link building campaigns, guys. And that is, 
say, for example, if I'm trying to reach out to this article on WordStream, this is written by guest author. So this is obviously not someone that I could reach out to because you know this is a guest post. So ideally, what I want to do and what a lot of people do, they just run WordStream.com through like a hunter tool or like some sort of email guessing software like Pitchbox. And they're trying to randomly generate email to end with that domain. Now, you end up either reaching out to like a random software engineer at WordStream or you end up reaching out to like support at WordStream.com. Doesn't really go a long way if you want to get a responsibility with the relationship, especially with a site that large. So you've got to find the right person. Normally, the way you would like to go about things, say if I'm reaching out to this article on YouTube SEO on, on VizMe, you want to find the writer, but you got to make sure that person works at the company. So I would normally have to do some reading on the writing uh, author bio. And then this clearly is a guest post because she says she's a marketing communication professional and there's no indication that she actually works at Bizme. And she doesn't because I work for Bizme and I know that she's not part of our team. This is clearly a guest post. So is this article on WordStream. So if you can't find an author that has written a piece of content who doesn't work for the company or the, the author information, like in this case, just doesn't exist on the page, then what you want to do is to go through LinkedIn, find some sort of content manager or SEO person at WordStream, someone relevant in the marketing team, and get the verified direct contact information of the right person and then put them in a spreadsheet. You got to verify the emails, make sure they're deliverable using a tool like Never Balance or Zero Balance, and you can you know, obviously put them in a spreadsheet and export it into a CSV file and then import in the software like Mailshake or Mixmax or whatever email address software you guys use, or you can just manually email, right? So that's how that process will look like manually. Now in Respana, here's our secret sauce. So we've, we've built a process around finding the right person. And that is something that's been in the works for about a year and a half. We've built a, 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 a I would say yeah, automation for finding the right contact, which you can just answer two simple questions to, and it will go ahead and find the direct verified contact information of the right person for you. And to, to make it work, you just have to answer two simple questions. One, hey, Farzad, should the respondent assign opportunities to the writers of these articles? And I say yes, but only if the writers work at the company. All right, so making sure that this person works at VizMe if I'm trying to reach out to this person. All right, but what if there is no person who works at the company or like the WordStream article, the author just doesn't exist in the, uh, um, in the page? Like, that's fine. Just go find, which is going to be most likely most of the articles they're reaching out to. Like, that's okay. Just go find one or two people at the company who match this exact position and seniority criteria. Someone who has the words like content, editorial, SEO, and their job title. And that's it. All I got to do is just go ahead and run this campaign, let it run on autopilot, and you don't have to touch a thing. You can just let this campaign run for you. And then once once the automation is complete, you're going to end up with a, a batch of opportunities like this. So for each and every single one of these articles, it would have had found the right person for you. Like, for example, if this is a big commerce article, I've run this automation a while back. Um, you, you go ahead and find, for example, this is a big commerce article. If I actually open it up, you can see that it's written by Michael Glover. And this guy actually doesn't work for the company. It's just a guest poster. So Respondent went ahead and found Victoria, who's a content marketing manager at Big Commerce, and got the verified direct contact information. Right. Now, something that you, you can replicate using obviously LinkedIn and some and some LinkedIn extension tools and and, and Hunter and, and then using an email verification tool to find it. But respond is something that it does on autopilot for you. So if you were to use that platform, obviously that's something that is done for you on autopilot. Now, for example, if, if I'm reaching out to Neil Patel site, respond went and found Kelsey, who's editor in chief at NeilPatel.com, got the contact info. Plus you can find all the company employee data. So you can run any sort of domain through the platform, find all the people who work at the company, get that verified content information in real time. So I could go and, for example, find our marketing director here in this case. But that leads us to the last step of the campaign, which is personalization. Now, guys, I don't care what software you guys use for sending pitches, but especially if you guys are reaching out to higher quality sites, say Social Media Examiner, you don't want to hit them with the same template pitch that you send out to everyone. So a lot of tools that call themselves personalization and they include variables in here, right? So URL and first name, that's called personalization. 
to me, that's just the minimum effort, right? That's not something I get a hundred emails every day. And the moment I look at these pitches, I can just tell <laughs> that 90% of these, they're just variables that they've included in here. Nobody wants to be the recipient of automated email. So what Responder does for you and what you can do manually yourself is that it goes through the articles that you're reaching out to, reads the articles and summarizes them in five key sentences. So it just pulls five important sentences from the article. Then you can use these to personalize the pitches. So I can say something like, oh, actually, I didn't know that 61% of people you service said this and that. So meaning that I'm actually implying to the person that, hey, I've done my research and I've read your content. This is not another spammy outreach email that you, that you might receive, right? So you still keep the same quality of personalized outreach and it's just you do this uh, faster. Now, if you're emailing these guys manually, you're not reading responder, you want to read through the article, make sure that you mentioned something interesting that I've talked about in the article in the pitch and add a lot of human touch to your emails. And that's it, guys. Normally, go ahead and just click on launch campaign and send you forget it. Start sending emails from your email account. As soon as someone replies, ends up in your email and you take it over from there. So that's normally the entire process. Now, let me, I, I sort of covered this outside of the presentation here, but basically select, so just to kind of quickly recap, select relevant content, which I explained, you, you wanna find blog articles that I mentioned your target keyword that, that, that are talking about a, a more broad topic and not directly competing with you. After you select them, uh, what determines the good opportunities that whether the person, the prospect has a target keyword in the body, and ideally you want them not to have linked to another resource or be in direct competition with your content and not necessarily go deep into that topic because then your pitch goes, hey, notice you guys didn't mention, you know, you mentioned YouTube SEO, but didn't really dive into the details. And we our team just put together a comprehensive pitch. Now, let's break down the pitch that I use. Now, the pitch that I use in the, in the um, if I actually go ahead and pull this back, I, I have it in the next slide, actually. The pitch that I um, use for this particular campaign, you wanna touch on a few different parts. And one is the subject line, two is explaining why you're reaching out to them, three is to define why exactly your content is relevant, include a question at the end of the pitch that we notice that has yeah, most likelihood because when people are asking you a question, you're more likely to respond. And you want to go ahead and give an incentive. And that's really the what what what's the most important part of the campaign is we don't actually pay for backlinks uh, despite a lot of other companies because we just use it as a, um, I would say, a, an indication of quality. If a site's asking for payments, guys, they're also accepting payments from other sources, from other sites, from other people who are reaching out to them. So that I would recommend highly uh, to stay away from them. And uh, you want to incentivize folks, obviously that has to be something important, but cash is normally never the answer. So we, we always try to collaborate with them on giving them a link from another guest post we were writing or social shows and, and um, things of that sort. Now, the pitch that I went through, I quickly explained that you you know you sort of start off by saying, hi, first name, hope you're having a great day of the week. And you know we finished reading your post and thought to share some thoughts on it. And we actually explained um, that we I would recommend putting the article title in there instead of the URL and just make the URL as a hyperlink. And then uh, you wanna definitely include a deep personalization aspect. So you wanna include some sort of um, interesting fact that talked about in the article. And you you basically hit them with the pitch. And it's like, hey, you mentioned our target keyword in there, didn't go through details. And we just put together a comprehensive piece that I think would make a nice addition. and you include the incentive. Now you automate the follow-up as well. 65% of responses come after the first follow-up. So you want to make sure that you definitely include at least one follow-up in your email. I do not recommend adding any more than two follow-ups because it's just spamming and it wouldn't really matter as far as getting the right contact. And uh, it wouldn't really uh, help you in terms of getting a response after that point. Now, I also briefly talked about finding the right content information. You want to find some relevant in the marketing team. And one last step is depersonalization, which I explained using the article summary snippets. Oh, no. 
Sorry, give me one second, guys. All right, perfect. And I talked about in the article summary snippets that you want to make sure that you, you've included the article um, you know, snippet and then you personalize the pitch deeply. Uh, and one last thing is that if you have uh, other touch points for the writer or the person you're reaching out to, including links, normally respond and get you the LinkedIn profile, but you can you can interact with them, send them a connection request on LinkedIn just to tell them that, hey, I'm a real person. I'm not necessarily a, a robot just sending you emails. Now, I'm going to take a step here really quick before I move on to the next part of our presentation, see whether we have any questions so far. So uh, I know I've been talking for a while. I think it's, it's good to uh, add, Andrew, uh, take a step back really quick and answer a few different questions, and then I can move on and move forward to uh, the second part of my uh, uh, presentation, which is talking about what would happen after that transactional banking change or collaboration is done. Yeah, great. Actually, a lot of the questions uh, you answered during the presentation, so we're gonna I'm gonna stick to the ones that we haven't touched on. So we have a question. Uh, let me just show it on the screen. Isn't it difficult to sort out the individual contributions of each SEO effort to total traffic among link building, ripple effect of paid ads, and obviously great content and a great offer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's why a lot of people aren't doing SEO is because it's very difficult to measure, especially when it comes to um, you know, the efforts you have to do is, is a puzzle, right? Now you got to create content uh, that is, um, you know, of high quality that you actually are adding value and, and, and it's keyword research to make sure you're writing bad stuff that people are actively searching for. And you have to go out and build link building and, and do link building and not just link building for the sake of getting links. You have to be from relevant si sites that have a, you know, relevant page on them and then they have to include a link with the right anchor text to you, the right page that you say. It's a nightmare. But the way I look at it, I see opportunity. <laughs> so, because if it's easy to do like PPC, everybody would do it. And what ha what would happen is that marketers ruin things. That's what P PPC is so freaking expensive nowadays that almost is not worth it when you calculate the cost of customer acquisition versus your LTV. Uh, it just doesn't make any more sense. And it's something that it's, uh, the way I describe is a black hole of cash. And then the more you put into it, that uh, you know, it, it never ends. So what I would like to do is to actually go ahead and uh, focus on on SEO just simply because it's so damn difficult. Now, if I can get good at this and I can nail it down to the stuff that works, that, that gives me a competitive advantage and that creates a barrier to entry from another site that might have just started a month ago, even if they've raised $300 million. But it's very difficult for them to compete with you on that level just because it takes time and energy. So the, basically the answer would be it is difficult, but it's possible, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's just a matter of rolling your sleeves up and getting to work. Um, let's see another question we have. Um, how would you convince bloggers or sites to put your links in their content? Um, obviously, this is something you already touched on in your presentation, but yeah, um, perhaps yeah absolutely. So this. how to find them, we talk about that in an extent. Uh, there's there's a variety of different strategies. What I went through, just one out of the 10,000 strategies that are out there for uh, link building. Now, obviously, there's tons of prospecting methods, but the pillars of outreach don't go away. So, one, you want to find the right people. Now, depending on the strategy, I'm going to talk about exactly how we nurture those relationships and how we do uh, other sorts of outreach strategies um, after we had that initial point of contact with them. But for us, the anchor text strategy has been working really the best as far as finding non competing posts that include your keywords. Now, how to convince them to put a link to your site? That uh, that's broken down into three different things you need to hit. One, actually four. Let's let's cover the most important three and a little bonus at the end. One is your strategy. So if you're just reaching, out, if I put together a content piece and I'm reaching out to people who are talking about the exact same thing, none of them, no way in hell, are going to link back to me. Very little, unless there you get two responses and some of them are asking for payment. So you want to uh, you want to have a strategy in place. You want to have a clear value prop in place. That hey, you talked about this topic, didn't dive deep. I put together a comprehensive piece that's of quality, and you can see the content, and it makes a nice addition. It would just make sense. So having contextual sense that that puts you at a competitive advantage versus like a hundred other pitches I get every day that are just crap. So that's number one. Number two is level of personalization. Nobody wants to feel like they're just, just subject to another email automation. So actually spending the time to research them and putting some personalization and adding a little human touch, little 
salt bay action to your pitches goes a long way just because most people don't do it. Third is the incentive. So in, incentive is something you can get very creative about. And, and people ask me this all the time, like, hey, if I were to you always advise against giving out cash for links, but how else would you incentivize a blogger that does this for a living? And people have different motives, guys. And, and as I said, I would be more than happy to pay cash for backlinks. It's sometimes easier and cheaper for us to give out cash versus the incentives that we're offering. But that to me is an, is, a, is an indication of quality, as I mentioned. If somebody's asking for payment, they're asking for payment from everybody. And sooner or later, they're gonna get caught, they're gonna get penalized, and that link's gonna be worth nothing. Plus, I, don't, I just don't trust sites that accept, ask for payment. Say, you reach out to HubSpot. They could care less about your hundred dollars, right? So, to me, sites that don't accept payment are the golden uh, sites that I want to get backlinks from. So, if somebody's asking for payment, I immediately blacklist them, right? That's just a really good qualifying factor. Now, the fourth one, which is not really talked about in the SEO space, is playing in your league, okay? And and that's something that uh, is not really talked about, unfortunately. For example, if I start a site tomorrow. Now the domain authority of like zero. <laughs> and I just put together two pieces of content. Don't reach out to HubSpot or Wordable or Vizme. You guys, I'm surprised of how many people reach out to Responda even. We're DR30, uh, 73 now. Even though we're, we've been around for about a year. They, they just started a blog like two months ago and they have like three backlinks and they're reaching out to us ask, uh, asking to collaborate. Why? <laughs> <laughs> so not saying you shouldn't, but I'm just saying this is not the right time. So playing your league means that you want to work with websites in your space that are at of at a similar you know uh, stage of their life cycle. That they're, they're also new. Say so if I'm a DR2 site, I want to work with a DR10, a 20, or 30 site, and that incremental changes. And it's quite easy to kind of get your site DR like 30. And that once you get to that point, then you kind of increase from there, right? So as a rule of thumb, we don't we always reach out to sites that are plus ten, plus or minus ten DR from ourselves. So a little less and a little more, but not too far off, uh, unless you have a really good relationship with those sites. So so hopefully that kind of sort of sheds some light on your question, uh, Fatima. Yeah, you, you definitely. Oh, yeah, you were able to read that because I wasn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I think you answered more than than enough for the specific question. Well, it's obviously not not up to me, but I'm I'm I think that this person got a lot more than they bargained for. And the next question that we have is actually I found it um, very uh, well more interesting than the others because it concerns other languages. So specifically, the question is how would all this work in the Danish market, for example, yeah. in the Danish language? Yeah, similar principles. People yeah. in Denmark are also people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, doesn't matter, same principles, but what you want to uh, do, so if you're using Respana, we still work with any Latimist language, so Danish, um, uh, German, you know, Norwegian, etc. It all works with them. But uh, the Danish market, what you want to do is that you want to, the keywords that you're looking for should just be searched for in your native language. So if you're uh, if, you're, if you have a piece of content in Danish, don't reach out to a site in the U.S. because it just doesn't make sense for someone to link back to a, uh, a blog post that is of a foreign language. So you want to make sure that the target keywords that you have are searched for in your native language. We also have some filters, and I'm sure Google also has some filters that, that you can just narrow it down to um, specific geographic areas, So meaning that you just shows up search results that if I was in Denmark and I was looking for a keyword, here's what would show up. Uh, so that's something that it's what we call market in Respond. But again, I don't want to plug in our tool too much. I, I want to give people alternative <laughs> to do things. Uh, you can do that in search engines like Bing or Google. Uh, but but principles remain exactly the same. OK, great. And, and I think we have one more question that was like specifically addressed to the part of the presentation that I has already been uh, uh, that you already talked about so we could leave the other questions for the very end okay perfect you want, yeah. you want to like switch it around yeah okay. yeah let's go ahead let's, right, let's, go. let's see the last question that we have that were yeah. about the subject line mm -hmm. pretty pretty uh pretty open question and yeah you, like the part that you ended on yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the subject line, uh, there's a few different best practices I recommend putting in. Uh, obviously, adding some sort of variable in the uh, subject line uh, 
has tend to work best. There is, you know what? Actually, let me do this. Backlinko, uh, Brian Dean has done a case study uh, of email outreach to actually work with, I believe was the, let me go ahead and actually share that link with you guys in the chat here. Uh, or if you do me a favor, Andrew, and just share with the, uh, I went ahead and put that in private chat. So uh, they've done a study of, uh, uh, they actually worked with a competitor of ours, Pitchbox, and they did a case study in outreach emails. And they noticed that the subject lines that are personalized and actually longer work best because that piques the curiosity of this. So there's a sweet spot of about, uh, and we actually use that information in the widget inside Respana. Uh, but at the subject line, actually, the sweet spot is between, I believe, 36 to 50 characters that tends to work the best because it's it's long enough that it would give some context into what the email is about and it's still not too short that it looks spammy just whatever you do don't don't say quick question that's just something that's been over time overdone by everyone add something add the organizations in there add the um uh, some sort of first name in there or something that changes for each what person that you're reaching out to and give some context over what it, what exactly is in the email. Don't get too creative. Sometimes when people are trying to do link building, they uh, come up with some like collaboration opportunity. I wouldn't call it that because it's really not a collaboration opportunity. So you want to you want to be truthful in terms of what you are offering so that when someone opens the email, they don't feel like they're deceived or they're like, oh, you just put that subject line there from to open the email. So. Uh, to be honest with you, it's more of an art than a science, really. There is not a simple, uh, I would say, clear-cut approach to writing a, a winning subject line. You've got to have to A-B test your emails, make sure what, what works best, depending on the strategy, depending on the industry that you're in. Really, there's no golden rule. Uh, but as I said, the, the basic principles of you know keeping it a little longer between 36 or 50 characters, adding a level of personalization only goes a long way. OK. All uh, right. Yeah, I think we can we can move on because let's we, move we, on. Let's just Perfect. keep on rolling in, actually. So, yeah. Perfect. All right. So, guys, I want to share with you guys now. Now that you guys have stuck around, some some a uh, little something some that isn't really talked about <laughs> in the in the SEO space. And and what what comes after you build that link? So, say for example, if you guys remember, we reached out to the say for example, this big commerce guys. And we've done a collaboration with them, or or we had a um, WordStream article that I believe I just um, removed. There you go. So I reached out to this WordStream article, and I actually managed to convince whoever is the right person to include a backlink to our YouTube SEO guide right here in their blog post. Now, what comes after? Do you just let them go? Like when when someone just gives you a backlink, you've done a collaboration and you have a point of contact, you have your foot in the door, most people, 90% of people just, that's it. They say, hey, thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> so once you do a transaction, I'll say, for example, I, I reach out to WordStream team, I get them a responder account in exchange for a link here, or I share that article with our like newsletter of 500K people and drive some traffic to it, and they include a link to our um, uh, post as a reference. That, to us, is just the starting point. So what we do then is that we have a two more we, we have two more steps that come after that transactional email. And that is pitching a guest post, which is quite targeted. I'm going to tell you how that works. And two is actually adding to our network of link partners. Now let me tell you exactly how to do this inside you can use a variety of number of different tools uh, for that matter. Uh, I tend to use Ahrefs just because I'm used to it. Doesn't mean it's the only software <laughs> they can do this. So I, I, I apologize to the um, to the uh, SE ranking team that I'm using their competitor here, but I'm pretty confident you can also do this in SE ranking. I just didn't have a chance before the webinar to um, um, let me actually word stream. Perfect. All right. So I didn't get a chance to actually try to replicate that inside SE ranking, but I'm going to tell you guys how we exactly go about finding uh, uh, the right pitch to tell them after we place that transactional link. So say that that uh, blog post that we collaborated with uh, is on WordStream. After we place a link and using the anchor text strategy, I normally look through on the organic search, their top 
competitors. Now, the top competitors here, what they have is Neil Patel and Adspresso. So you could go ahead and, or neilpatelmoz.com, you can go ahead and use a feature called Content Gap. Do you guys have this in, in SE ranking, Andrew? Yeah, we do, but it's just called a bit differently. I can actually sh show that as well. Please, please, afterwards, uh, please show me how to do that in SE ranking uh, once I go through this here in a sec. Cool, cool, cool. But, uh, but basically, you could go ahead and look up neilpatel.com and Moss. So look up a couple of their competitors here and using the content gap feature, which we're going to show you also how you can do that in SEO ranking, try to find the keywords that both of their competitors are ranking for, but they aren't. So I actually set the intersection at two targets. So meaning that both of their competitors are ranking for that keyword, but they aren't. Now, this brings up a list of opportunities. For example, one of them is Google Webmaster Tools, right? That both Neil Patel and Moz are ranking for. Now, this is a highly competitive keyword with a very high volume, but I believe because of WordStreams, uh, you know, obviously they have a DR, I think 90. I'm pretty confident that they're able to rank for this keyword if they were to write a post on it. Now, once we do place that link, then what we do is that we after we run it through um, our you know content gap analysis, we hit them with this pitch, and I tell them, hey, thanks man for getting back to us. Glad that our link would be a good fit, and I have a couple of uh, options I can offer in return. We can give you a link back, obviously, but also I did a lot of digging on Ahrefs and noticed that a couple of your competitors are ranking for this keyword, but you aren't. I actually have a full-time writer that's more than happy to write an SEO-friendly quality piece of content about that target keyword for you, right? Now, what would happen is that I've already broke with bread with these guys and I've offered them a clear-cut value prop that basically says, hey, your competitors are ranking for this keyword. You aren't. Let me cover that for you. Now, in our experience, over 80 90% say, heck yes, <laughs> please, thank you. Now, once we do that, let me tell you what we do next. And that's when we really, we go for the kill. We go ahead and tell them, hey, thanks, John. Here's the piece of content, right? So that's step three. Step one was transactional link exchange. Step two is a targeted guest post pitch. And step three is adding them to our network of partners. Now we, we've collaborated with this guy so much that I tell him, hey, and for example, Andrew from SEO Ranking, I know that uh, you guys are also, I know we, you guys are publishing guest posts on our sites using your relationships. We're doing the same thing on, on very high quality sites like HubSpot and SE Ranking and Wordable. Now, for example, I would love to add you to our network of partners. Then we put together a little sheet that we keep track of all the link exchanges and all the, uh, I would say, guest posts that we are writing in the future. And they will tell us the links uh, that, or blog posts that they would like to build links to. And then what we do then is that we, uh, anytime we're producing any pieces of external guest posts, we go back to our partners list and we find and handpick the URLs that would make sense in the context of the guest post. So we normally include anywhere an average of five to six partner links in the, in the guest post. And these are just educational pieces from our network of partners that we think would make a nice fit. Now, what would happen then is that it would create a little ripple effect for our average. Now, anytime we're putting out a piece of content, we're, we're building backlinks also for our partners, aside from ours. And then, so that guest post that we publish would result in five, 10 other backlinks through our network of partners to us from different domains, right? So even though your um, cold outreach would not necessarily result in a whole lot of links from the get-go, what that does is that establishes those initial relationships for you, which then you can harness to place a guest post. And then once you have that network of partners, then you can go ahead and work with those sites and actually uh, create a ripple effect. So one outreach strategy that you know that uh, results in a link exchange and a guest post might result in 10 links from different domains. And that's how you can really skyrocket the growth of your website by building relationships with these sites. And that's it, guys. That's it on my end. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Farzad. And, okay. and I hope everybody enjoyed it. So uh, let me quickly just take a minute just to show you guys uh, how you can find the keyword gap using Please. SEO. Ranking. 
So, uh, okay, we, should, we have the screen here. So I already accessed the tool competitive research here. And as you can see, I uh, entered Neil Patel and then I went to competitor comparison. Then I entered two more websites and then we have this Venn diagram. Uh, you can separately ah. see the breakdown of traffic. And then the most interesting part is that you have the missing keywords here and you can click on any website and find out which keywords they are specifically missing. So if we are want to expand Neil Patel's uh, keyword list, then we just do this, missing keywords, and see all the keywords that he is not targeting. And we can do that. Also, we can find unique keywords that are targeted by each of the websites and all the common ones to see how you compare to each one of them. Yeah. This so. is really cool. This is a lot more visual than uh, Ahrefs just gives you a list of keywords. <laughs> and this is, uh, you can actually see, this is pretty cool. I'm going to start using that. Okay. I have a SE ranking account, so I'm going to have to baby step myself into it. Yeah, Perfect. definitely. Right. Um, awesome. Let's, um, let's, we have a couple of more qu really good, good questions that I wanted to address. Well, I, I don't want to put a label on them, but just they're all good questions. But anyway, here's another one we have from Yola. Okay, so is this link building applied to new Google Analytics 4 and all the changes uh, that Google is doing? Uh, if you had video or audio, we have to transcript the content for... Okay, so this is a little grammatically incorrect, but I think yeah. I got the, <laughs> the gist of it. So, guys, Google's job is to identify the best content for the users, okay? Now, any updates that they do is an attempt to make their algorithm smarter to identify the best content. Now, if you, and a lot of people ask me this question, it's like, hey, is link building dead? Let me explain, let me give you a little history. Back in the days when AOL and Yahoo were, were the most prominent search engines, the reason why Google ended up beating most of them is because of the algorithm they built on top of links. So. Uh, AOL, I believe their algorithm was predominantly based on keywords and finding most keyword dense articles. And Google was like, no, no, we can find other articles that have an indication of authority from other websites that are talking about them. And that algorithm, what really is put the foundation for Google and that's why it became the number one search engine. So the fact that is that their, their platform is built on top of this. Now that what they've become, uh, what, what they've been doing the past 18, 20 years has been identifying these junk links, identifying these PBNs and ignoring them and then rewarding websites to actually have quality content from authentic organic contextual backlinks. One of our customers actually used to be a, a, a quality assurance team of the webmaster team at Google. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that we're we're not worried. If any Google updates in, in the past seven, eight years that Visme has been around, every single Google update, most of them have done uh, more good than harm to our website because we have better content. Now, some of the search results might not be as of high quality. And the way I talk about this is because a lot of SEOs have done shady stuff for the link building. So, all I'm trying to say, the long-term play that you guys can build a website that, that would bring traffic to you for years to come, and you want to make sure that is algorithm update proof, is not to cheat. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Because it's very difficult to create quality content, very difficult to build relationships and build these quality backlinks. Most people aren't doing it. They're taking shortcuts. They're buying links. They're paying for links. They're uh, going and using some freelancers that spam. And that's something that is uh, something I would recommend you guys stay away from. So um, is this link building applied to new Google Analytics? Uh, I don't know what that question means, but what I can tell you with certainty is that um, once you play your cards right, then it becomes Google's job to reward you. And you wouldn't have anything to worry about when it comes to algorithm updates. All right, great. Thanks a lot. We have a question from uh, Griffin about uh, brand mentions so are they important to, for uh, the link building strategy and could you convert mentions to usable backlinks to further build your build up your profile yeah so one thing that griffin uh, a lot of people have opinions in the seo space and i'm sure you've been in other webinars that people just talk about uh, how google is and to be honest with you nobody knows and it's a black box and 
lots of these ex SEO experts don't want to admit the fact that they don't know. What we have is indications of impact. Now, one thing that I can say with certainty is that backlinks are relevant. The anchor texts are important. Uh, that's something that Google has said publicly, and that is a an, an direct um, uh, algorithm um, metric. Now, as far as brand mentions go in particular and whether or not they're worth re reaching out to make him into a link, there is a campaign called Unlinked Mentions, and I recommend you guys actually take a look at it. Uh, Ahrefs has a good article on it. I'm sure I'm not sure whether SE ranking guys have an article on it. We're writing on uh, not, yet. not yet. OK, all right. Uh, feel free to look up Google Unlinked Mentions. And it uh, tells you guys step by step how you can identify sites and scrape sites that have mentioned your brand, and then you can reach out to them. And to be honest with you, it wouldn't hurt uh, to reach out to some of these to make the link clickable. Worst comes to worst. These links are actually leading to your website so that the users that land on those pages would actually be able to more easily find you. Uh, and whether or not that actually impacts your domain authority, it is still a backlink. I, I think it does. But uh, matter of fact is, at the end of the day, my opinion doesn't matter here. So what I would recommend is that if you guys have a site that has some sort of authority, like we do this on an ongoing basis on the business side because we just get so many natural mentions of backlinks now that we have some sort of brand recognition. Um, we do have some folks that mention us don't link back to our website and we do identify them in batches and reach out to them and reach out to them once every six months or so. Uh, so I, my recommendation is to do it just simply because even if it doesn't help you, it definitely wouldn't hurt you. So why not? <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot. We have another question from Kiss Planet. Mm hmm. Uh, about an influencers. So if they post positive comments about your brand and products in exchange for money, is this, what's the real value of that? Uh, influencers reach out to post. Uh, so I'm not understanding the question directly. Are you talking about sponsor posts? So meaning that you pay influencers to actually write a review of your site and then, uh, no, I'm thinking of this is like, it says post positive comments. So I'm guessing as an interaction with the piece of content. Oh, I don't think that's what they mean. But so the comments themselves, uh, those are no follow links. So regardless of whatever widget they use for post comments and don't waste your time, guys. I, I still see some people do this, that they go on other people's sites and just post comments and include link to their site. These are direct no follow links. And that's something that has absolutely no SEO value. I do not recommend wasting your time on that. But I think what uh, here this question means is uh, is actually paying folks to review your product or services and um, then put together a sponsored post and link back to your website. Now, Google actually has just introduced, uh, well, not just, a few months ago, they've introduced uh, new tags uh, uh, for links, and one of them is called uh, sponsor, so usage is sponsored. Uh, now, technically speaking, posts that you guys pay for for your reviews of your software need to have those links attached to them just to tell these Google algorithm that, hey, this is a sponsored link. We were paid for this. Now, most people don't, <laughs> so they just have it either as a rel uh, do follow or uh, just they don't include a rel in there. Uh, so to be honest with you, they're not supposed to do this. They're just they're supposed to basically um, publicly declare that this is a sponsor link. So the fact whether or not that has value or whether or not that's negative, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that negative. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think it bears much value. It depends on the site that it's on, right? That's what SEO people say when they don't know answer to questions. Say it depends, <laughs> and it really does in this case because if if it's a site, for example, if I'm uh, reaching out to um, social media examiner or a big influencer like, for example, um, Sean Baker or, or or Jeff Bellos or some of these guys that might charge for a review post of your service. Um, I don't think that bears much value in terms of SEO if they do things properly and actually mark those links as sponsored and uh, declare public that it's, it's a sponsored post. Uh, I don't think it would in any way hurt your brand. I think if anything, it would bring in bottom of the funnel traffic. I think it's more so about utilizing their audience and, and more of a brand awareness play than an SEO play. So I wouldn't go and pay these influencers to build a review of your site and put on your site just to make your SEO of your site better. I don't think that um, has much of an impact. What, what you want to think about is their audience and their engagement and the relevancy of their audience. If their audience is your is closely related to your target audience and they, you think your product or service would be, may be beneficial for them, yeah, by all means, power to you. But I wouldn't do that for SEO purposes necessarily. 
All right, so we we got a feedback that it is understood from the the Kiss Planet. I just added. I, I, I'm used to saying names of people, but when it's like Kiss Planet, I don't know. It's pretty weird. Anyway, we have the next question from Pepper's Ghost, and he actually has well not he, but this person has three questions, and they are not they they were written separately. So let's start yeah. off with the first one. Yeah, that's a great question about incentive. And I get this question almost on a daily basis. Like, hey, what are some of the incentives I can offer? And guys, you can get very creative on that. And the thing is, it all comes down to the industry you're in and the type of people you're reaching out to. So an incentive is what other people value, right? So for example, say I have 100 followers on Twitter. When I tweet, two people like it. And one of them is my cousin. So. <laughs> When I reach out to other bloggers, I don't offer them that, hey, I will share this on my Twitter. Because <laughs> guess what? It doesn't bear much value for them. So a real incentive, there is no easy way around it. You gotta have to offer something that the recipient actually values. So let me give you an example. For example, when we run average campaigns for SEO related content, meaning that the recipients are more likely very aware of SEO and they know link building and we own a link building software. So what we offer as an incentive is like, hey, let me get your respondent account on the house for three months. Now we don't do the same thing on the Visme side when we are reaching out to design blogs. What we offer them is like, hey, we have a community, we have a Facebook group of say 15,000 designers and I'm more than happy to share this content piece with that audience and we include a screenshot of the engagement that it gets. And if you were kind to reference our article in here, that tends to work best. So all I'm trying to say, we have a customer, for example, as a food blog and they talk about keto diet. For them, they send them like some a gift card to um, Freshly or I don't know what that is. That's like the food service companies. All I'm trying to say, you gotta customize it to the, to the people that you're reaching out to see what they would value they actually use and that they think it's useful and then offer that put it in the page okay thanks thanks a lot farzad so mm -hmm. the next question is also from the same person it's also what are some of the big no-nos when reaching out asking for backlinks <laughs> okay i can talk about this till tomorrow but there's a, a variety of different things one is uh reaching out to the support if there is a right uh, so sometimes reaching out to generic email addresses. That's a big no-no. And that is you reaching out to, for example, info at or support at visme.co and trying to place a backlink there. That to me is a big no-no because the company is large enough. We have content managers, we have writers, we have editors, SEO people. Find a right person and reach out to them. Now, sometimes some of the smaller bloggers, they don't have a fancy content manager. The blog is run by one person and there's no information about that person is they just have an admin at something.com. That case is okay. So finding the right person and not just directly contacting the generic inbox of whatever domain it is that you're trying to reach out to. That's number one. Number two is personalization. And that is making sure that um, you're not just relying on variables as a personalization. You want to actually add a human touch to your email, not just talking about, okay, include the URL title in here and then you call that personalization. That's not personalization. Three is incentive. Uh, I get pitches on a daily basis. Hey, I want to publish a guest post on your site. Tell me your prices. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing your positive response. I get this email almost every day. I think I just got one during the course of this presentation actually. Uh, and please, for the love of God, include an incentive, have a clear cut um, pitch and don't reach out to a site that's the or 7080 site and offer a guest post that is not working anymore. Uh, if they wanted your content, they would have asked you to write a piece of content for them. When, and here's the thing. I, I'm a big opponent of, um, of guest posting as a first approach, uh, as a first touch, just simply because it's been overdone and marketers ruin things very easily. So uh, the fact that you just reach out with, to the generic inbox of the uh, the company without any level of personalization and offer the guest post, that to me <laughs> is an instant block. So um, stay away from it. Be human. Don't uh, don't reach out and uh, and just for the sake of uh, getting a backlink. Your goal should always be building a relationship and make sure that you know. 
just have in the back of your mind of people you're reaching out to are human uh, that that you're contacting. You know, you're not just uh, over even though you're communicating over email. There, there are still people. So, I, I mean, I could keep on going on and on, Andrew, but I think that's good enough to to leave us. Okay, we have another one from Lucy McCormick from the UK mm -hmm. asking uh, if they are looking to expand to the US and are there any key differences that they should consider uh, in terms of backlinks when they launch their product over the pond? So in the US. Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't actually say there's much differences when it comes to link building. I think that is, remains the same, especially in UK is quite similar processes when it comes to link building. But what I would suggest is the keyword uh, research process, uh, the step before link building when it comes to content creation, that's different. So if you're if you're trying to target mainly people in the US, you want to research keywords that are getting more traffic in the US, uh, the geographic search and, and make sure that you um, the right content that would make sense to the um, you know to the culture and the, the, to what actually people are searching for. Uh, very little people are searching for like tea and biscuits in the U.S. and more people are looking for hot dogs and beer. So understanding what keywords are getting rankings and writing content for them, but link building process is almost the same. Great, right, thanks a lot. And another one uh, about so say you have um, a multilingual website and do backlinks from language A impact the set of the section in language B in terms of rankings? Yeah. So. So a backlink is a vote of um, popularity for that website. Now, if you have backlinks, so we, we have the same thing also on a Visme site where we have a Spanish site and we also have our English site. The link building process um, would, would be almost identical except for that for the Spanish pages, we actually try to reach out to other Spanish websites. So that opens the horizon for the prospects that we could reach out and there's a lot less competition for. So necessarily saying a, a backlink to an English page would help a Spanish page to rank, I would say yes in a way that it does increase your overall domain authority of the website, uh, but you still want to focus more on, on a page level, necess not necessarily just on the, on the website level. So if you have a multilingual site and you want to build backlinks to individual pieces or, or individual uh, pages of your site in a separate language, my recommendation is to do your link building also in that language, trying to get some backlinks from anchor text, from websites that, that have the same language. But but what my experience has been, especially on the business side, is that we, we actually didn't put much effort into our uh, Spanish pages, uh, even though they're getting a lot of traffic. Uh, but the reason why they are is because our English sites, our domain has a good amount of authority itself. So once we put out new pages, I increase the likelihood of them being able to rank in other uh, countries as well. Great, thanks a lot. And this is looks like the last question, so we're gonna end it after here. And uh, the question is, um, Henrik is trying to set up a new website, and would you suggest to pick a few authoritative sites and buy links from there just to get started? Right, yeah, no. <laughs> there goes your question, answered. Uh, so, I, as I mentioned, I. I'm an opponent of paying for backlinks, period. So we do not pay for backlinks, uh, regardless of whatever that other site is. I would recommend if you're just starting out a site, remember, I started the site, responda.com had a domain authority zero. We purchased the domain late 2019, started link building 2020. In one year, we had domain authority 73 with 20K monthly organic traffic. Though it's possible to do it. And the way we've done it, that worked well for us. And again, people might do it in different ways. Um, the people have different methods has been playing your league. Start from smaller sites, reach out to other smaller blocks in your space. And then as your domain authority starts incrementally increasing, then open doors to reaching out to some of the bigger sites. And that would be my recommendation instead of going jumping the gun and just paying for uh, sponsored posts from bigger sites. All right. And uh, actually, since we promised a bonus for uh, the best question, do you have a question in mind that you were asked during this webinar? Yes, I like the multilingual question. That I think was a very interesting point that they brought up. Uh, so I'm not sure who that was exactly who asked this, but I think it was was it about was it the um, language A impacting language B? That yes. one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Perfect. So, who was the who was the person? Put it in the comments. Yeah, the name. It's Marketing Pont Europe. But so we're gonna reach out to this uh, group of people or a person or this team, and. Uh, 
present them with the optimum subscription plan for one month. Awesome. So congratulations and thanks for <laughs> everyone for, for all your questions. And thank you, Farzad, for all the uh, interesting information, all the insights. It was very interesting to hear. There's a lot to absorb here. So definitely check the, check out the replay and uh, the links that we threw in the chat. And yeah, and also, as well as uh, just check out the Respana, check out Vi uh, Vizme. And, and SU ranking. SU ranking. <laughs> obviously, obviously. All righty, perfect. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. And thank you guys for sticking with me. I know I, I talked for long periods of time. So I appreciate you guys sticking around and hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Same to you. All righty, bye-bye. Thank you, take care. Stay safe, bye.